Hi, everybody. Our lobby is filling up as we get closer to the top of the hour. Thanks for joining today. We'll give it a few more minutes so all the attendees have a chance to log on. And while we're waiting, I do have a couple polling questions that I'm going to um, let the audience respond to. And this lets us get a better understanding of who our, our audience is today. So I'll open up the polls and leave them open for 30 seconds or a minute or so and see what the responses are. Thanks for responding, everybody. Give it a few more seconds. All right, not surprising. We are in this is uh for your information as well, most of our attendees are using Altium as their layout tool. Okay. We've got one more poll to launch here just to get some audience engagement and then we'll get started. I'll leave this open for a minute or so and then let folks trickle in and we'll get rolling. Right, getting some good results in. Okay, Weirin, are you ready for the introduction? Yes, I am. Great. Thanks everybody for participating in the polls. So, Weirin, our audience today is, uh, there were a lot of all of the above responses. Um, so that's great. And then a few specifically interested in thermal management which is uh, very appropriate for today's session, as well as signal and power integrity. So um, just for your information, thank you everybody for participating. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, CST Studio for Electronic Design for PCB Thermal Analysis. My name is Nate Woodard and I'm the Electromagnetics Business Development Manager here at Computer Aided Technology. And a little bit about computer-aided technology, we have a passion for helping our clients across multiple simulation physics domains. And so today we're very excited to discuss a powerful workflow within the CST suite of multi-physics solvers. I'll be your host for today for the hour that we have scheduled and shortly I'll be introducing our distinguished presenter, Weirin Zhu from Dassault. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You can submit questions through the control panel at any time. Um, we will collect these and address these during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And I think without further ado, let me introduce Weirin Zhu, whose role at Dassault is electromagnetics technical expert in the Simulia brand. Weirin, please take it from here. Sure. Thank you, Nate. 
Let me share my screen. Can you see it okay? Looks great. Yep. This is the right one, I think. You can see it okay, right? I can, yep. Yep, excellent. Uh, wait, I think I'm going to... This is better. better. Now it's in presentation <laughs> mode. Yeah, yes. that's better. Yes, that's better. All right, so... Um, Thank you for the introduction, uh, Nate. Um, and welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, uh, wherever you are. Um, as Nate said, this is part two of a uh, three-part PCP mod series. Um, I think last week you have um, have a, my colleague Emmanuel like, talking about uh, SIPI. And today I would like to uh, go into another S aspect of the PCB design, that, that is thermal uh, management. Uh, so before we start talking about thermal, let's maybe uh, have a, a short, a brief history of the modern PCB, just for the entertainment of it. Um, so I, I got interested, intrigued by um, how, how PCB come along in the format we know it. Uh, so I did some reading and uh, if you haven't Googled it, and uh, just listen to me now. Right? Um, so can you hear me okay? Yep, we hear you, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Um, so in the, um, where we were, we were at the uh, talking about the small history or a little history about where the PCB come along that way we, we saw it. Um, so uh, the idea of, of the print sticker board actually started very early. Uh, you can't probably can't believe it. I, I was uh, shocked when I learned that the idea was actually starting from the beginning of um, the 19th century, the um, 20th century actually, uh, in 1903 uh, by a German scientist called Albert Hansen, who filed the patent in um, England for his basic service design for telephone systems. And then in 1927, an American inventor called Charles Dukas uh, patented a, a version of the circuit board. Um, and then um, the actual, many people consider the father of modern PCB goes to um, an Austrian engineer who who is called Paul Eisler, and he uh, was actually um, not really an electro electrical engineer. He was, a, uh, he was interested in printing, and he saw the potential of uh, bringing the printing technology onto electronics. So when he um, was uh, in England, he um, assembled a radio purely using um, the well, a printed version of the PCB and, um, and present to a radio company and it didn't go anywhere, uh, although they are imp impressed with his work. Um, however, the military picked it up as a very um, proper technology for um, operating um, anti-aircraft um, devices. Uh, so that was well, get, get pretty good usage in World War II. Um, but after that, um, NASA in the peacetime, NASA find it very suitable for space application because it's lightweight and um, low power and low, it, it, it didn't generate a lot of heat and all that in, in those times. So it was uh, believed that it went to the moon with, uh, with Neil Armstrong in 1969. Um, so after that, uh, the US Army um, Signal Corps uh, managed to figure out a way to speed up the production of PCBs, very similar, or actually probably the ancestor of our current uh, PCB by using a, um, lay, um, a layer of copper foil um, and lay on a base, base of uh, laminate, and then draw a wiring pattern with a basis resistant ink, and then the, the copper was um, per, that was not protected by the ink is removed by the acid, um, and the remaining part is your uh, is a wire. So 
quite interesting how it come along to the to today's form. A long history, many people con contribute to the development of PCB. I hope you find it pretty fascinating uh, when you read about history. Um, so the PCB board itself has evolved since then quite rapidly. Um, and you can pretty much, when you open up any modern electronics, you will see uh, those uh, green colored, uh, sometimes blue colored, some, sometimes even uh, purple colored uh, printed circuit board in there. And um, it, the size, I, it's like everything else, it becomes smaller. And because of that, all the technology becomes changing very rapidly. Uh, for example, the holes that on the PCB that's for uh, conducting electricity or signals, they become much smaller than before. Uh, and the component used to be a through hole, meaning that they you know, just mounted on the board and soldered on, but now become like surface mounted. Uh, and then, um, and then that's not enough because surface surface mounted technology has lead, and that taking too much space and PGA and bogger array become more popular. And when you look at the PCB as a whole, all the sizes, uh, uh, the lead pitch, the BSI, the layer count, the dielectric thickness, every dimension you name it, it becomes shrinking dramatically. Um, and the board go through a, the material that board uses, go through a very interesting evolution, starting from even paper, paper and to epoxy, epoxy resin, um, with fiber, fiber, fiber reinforced or uh, fiberglass reinforced, FR4, um, to what we sometimes see now, ceramics, uh, metal cores, um, so-called MC PCBs, amazing uh, development of board material, and the um, the interconnection becomes very high density, and with the IoT development, the PCB become miniaturized and even flexible, have to be able to bend to fit into where it needs to be, um, and the last but not least uh, is the power that the PCB can and is handling right now. It used to be very small, milliamps uh, to the amps, and now sometimes go to a dozen of amps to even hundred amps. Uh, think about EV, how much um, electricity handles in, in, in the system. It's amazing. So that brings up to our today's topic. What happens when you have to run a lot of power on your PCB board, right? Um, what's wrong with that? Because that would inevitably causing the temperature problem or the third so-called thermal problem. Uh, what's wrong with temperature being a little high? Uh, when you have a higher temperature, the electronic tends to fail. As a matter of fact, uh, according to a survey in 1990, 54% uh, of the electronic failure are due to uh, the temperature. The temperature no, not only uh, causing electronic to fail, but it's also reduced the productive life of the component. Uh, it was believed that um, some of the um, uh, semiconductors, some rectifiers are going to not work well beyond 75. It was also um, in a uh, study that shows uh, some of the capacitors reduce their usable life by, by a third. Um, when you have, when you elevate the temperature from 25 to 75 degrees Celsius, um, sometimes the uh, ICs are even more dramatically reduced when you elevate the temperature and stay there for, for a very long time. It can drop the life by nine times as well. So those are all significant challenges to today's uh, circuit board designer. So let's take a look at where the heat come from. It's Quite obvious, I think, to everyone here in the audience that the heat are coming mainly from two places. The first one is from the chip that you're mounted on the board. The second place is from the trays. The trays usually not a big concern um, because the amount of current it handles usually, you know, in the in the old times are not 
too big. Um, and they're copper, very good conductor. They don't dissipate a lot of heat in the past. But as, as we mentioned earlier, when the power goes up, um, the traces are able to and is handling many amps of, of current and generating a lot of heat. That's no longer something that you can ignore. So that needs to be addressed and needs to be considered carefully. Now, before we drill down to um, about all the amazing things we can do with CSD Studio Suite, let's step back a little bit and take a look at where the heat actually goes when it's reached, um, when it's being dissipated, right? So um, it's, it's actually quite interesting. Um, we need, here we need to deal with heat transfer. And I have a good news for you is uh, in heat transfer, there are only three basic modes of, of, of heat transfer. They are uh, conduction, convection, and radiation. And there, are only, there are three and only three. So that's, a good, that's, that's good news. And it's very easy. Actually, you already probably experienced that um, in your life, in your daily life. For example, the summertime here, uh, if you were going for camping and light a campfire and lit a and trying to boil a pot of water here, like I can show here. Uh, what happened is that when you stand in a safe distance to the fire, you would experience some radiation from the fire. See, and then the um, the water would take some heat up and become circulated as convection, and the heat was conducted through the pot uh, or the, the kettle, um, and that's conduction. And eventually, there's some radiation happening for the cattle on the surface as well. But that's just a campfire. Uh, that's not probably not something that we were interested to discussing. We're talking about electronics today, PCB. So what happened to a PCB when the heat is, uh, is dissipated? Um, but like I said earlier, the heat, one of the major heat sources is the chip. So when the chip in this picture of dissipate is starting to dissipate, in, the first place is find itself is a neighboring object. Uh, the, the PCB is always its neighbor. You don't, may, may or may not have a, have a heat sink there, um, but, but you always are going to have a PCB for the chip to work on. Uh, so it finds itself, um, it, it finds itself on, on the PCB, and then let's see what happens. Um, so once you have it uh, on the PCB, it, it's trying to go everywhere on the PCB. Um, and then that started to get a little murky. What, what you know, and, and you see, it can get to the PCB and then it can read it to the environment and it can do the convection and go through the airflow. That seems to be a, 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 a uh, overwhelming uh, things to understand. But I have another good news for you. Um, you can conceptually think of the, all of these heat transfer mode uh, as some simple electrical circuit. Yeah, indeed, it's actually simpler than most of the circuit. It's just a, a strict DC powered um, resistor only. Now we can talk about the capacitor later, but let's just assume we only consider the steady state is that you only need the resistor in the picture here. So the idea is this, when the heat coming out, it will seize the PCB board and that's a resistor. And once it's reached every corner of the PCB need to go out, that's the convection. Re that's need the convection and re need the radiation to get out. And that's another set of resistors, but they're in parallel, you see here, because they are working together with the same temperature difference and working together uh, very well. <laughs> yeah. So if you think this way, the things become much clearer. Um, so all you have to do as a designer, trying to cool your electronics, you want to, de you want to decrease all the resistors involved. Well, how do we do that? Let's, step, let's take another step back on um, the mechanism of the heat to go. I made a little um, water tank analogy here, trying to help us to gauge how important things are from all three modes of heat, tra heat transfer. You know, in, the, in this analogy, um, the heat source is our valve here. That uh, actually the faucet, I should say, the faucet is re releasing a lot of heat into the water tank. And the level of water tank is our temperature. And we have three major valves, convection, conduction, and radiation. They like the water in, in, in my analogy would be the heat. They let, let them go, right? And uh, you, can, you can imagine that um, uh, for, from our experience, you have a higher water level, the, um, the speed that's it's going out 
or the flow rate is higher. And that makes sense. So uh, if you are reducing the um, those valves, and then you have, you need a higher water level to pump all the water out or let let it out. Now you can reach steady state or equilibrium when the water come into the tank equal to the water coming out of the tank. So the, all these analogies are very much the same in heat transfer. When you have the heat generation equal to the heat relief leaving the system, you, re, you reach a thermal equilibrium. And the valve, if they are open wide, the water tank can have a lower temperature. Uh, so water can have a lower water level to reach equilibrium. Otherwise, you need a higher level to reach equilibrium, right? So I hope that that makes sense to you. And to further our to quantify our analogy here, we can put them into uh, some equations here. Um, I don't want you to, you know, to get intimidated by these equations. But the thing taking home is that the convection coefficient that usually people talk about uh, when when you're deal, dealing with convection heat transfer can be conceptually think it as a conductance or it's the inverse of the resistance. I label the one over R here in our circuit analogy. Similarly, in the conduction and radiation, we could, it's actually not super scientifically correct, but we can lump them into a effective heat transfer coefficient. So in the convection heat transfer coefficient, the H is a function of really Reynolds number, uh, Rayleigh number, and the Proton number. And so it sounds pretty intimidating, but what it's trying to say is it's a, mat it's a function of the flow. Uh, most of the time, sometimes it's a function of the temperature in natural convection, for example. Uh, the conduction is basically a function of the conductivity and the material need to dissipate to. Uh, how big are they? The D dispense, stands for some distance, uh, and then the uh, for radiation, it's based mainly the function of a view factor and your temperature level to, for your for your heat uh, to go out. So that's that's what we were dealing with. We can lump all these ideas into one single uh, comparable something that we compare with. Now, if I plug in some of the typical numbers, you end up with this uh, order of magnitude. Let me explain a bit more here. Um, so for the convection, you uh, you you have this one. You are working with a number between somewhere between two, four. I put it put a four here uh, as a representative of magnitude. It's not absolute. I have to be four. Sometimes it's one. Sometimes it's eight. That lower range representing when you have a natural convection, meaning that you don't have any force of cooling, just a device sitting there by itself. Uh, that would be the lower range. But if you have a powerful uh, force cooling mechanism like a cooling fan and you have a strong blowing to it, strong fan blowing on over your PCB board, you can end up with uh, 20, 30, and then again 100 is meant to be saying this is order of magnitude you can reach uh, with that uh, cooling, mechan cooling mechanism. And the radiation is quite stable here. Uh, when you plug in the normal temperature that we are dealing with, not saying we're having a fire or anything, just like the uh, normal electronic working range, you end up with a fairly narrow range, much narrower range. It's always between eight, uh, 10 ish. So when you reach 20, it means your temperature really high uh, and you really probably don't want to be that way. So it's quite nice. It has a narrow range. It's fairly constant. It doesn't change a lot. Um, but this does tell us something here. When you design the electronics, if you're planning, to not use any force cooling. Um, ideally not, right? Because nobody wants to have a fan that can fail. Then you need to consider radiation contribution. You want to maximize your radiation contribution by uh, maybe painting your device into darker colors or non-reflective colors to maximize the radiation heat transfer. Um, now, the last one I, I would like to explore a little bit further uh, with you is the conduction to PCB, because PCB is our main target here. We'll drill down slightly more. You see, the PCB has a much higher equivalent uh, thermal conductivity, um, sorry, equivalent thermal uh, heat transfer coefficient here, uh, which means it's a really a preferred road for heat to go first. 
but there's a little caveat here. Uh, that is when the heat actually go to the PCB, uh, as it uh, finds itself easy to go, uh, it has to go out to the convection and the radiation anyway in the end. Uh, but let's not worry about that for now. Let's dealing with um, the conduction in the PCB first. Let's take a closer look at what it takes for the heat to be conducted very well inside of a PCB. Now, the heat, when the heat drill into or come into a PCB, the first thing you want to do, you can see uh, a picture here. I illustrated the heat wants to spread. Um, of course, you wanted to you know, go over the, the thickness and to the other end, but the other end needs to, to find a way out. But another way of trying to find out is it, it's going somewhere else or away from the heat source. So that's, that's what, it, what it's trying to do. Um, sometimes I would think uh, the heat transfer or, or for that matter, all main, what I should say, major physical phenomena, it's like a human being. We want to find the easy way out. So the heat also does the same thing. You're trying to find the easiest way out. It happens to be finding that that way is easier than other ways. And there's an interesting factor here. Um, is the ratio of the heat source to the PCB board is the dominant factor of the spreading resistance I'm talking about here. So when heat spreading, it meets the material and find the find the resistance. And someone in 19 uh, 1995 wrote a paper and gave us this nice formula showing it's theoretically related to the ratio of the, uh, the heat source to your PCB board or to any kind of conductive material next to it. Now, this not, should not come into super, as a surprise. It's quite intuitive. The larger the, 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 of the heat source, uh, the less spreading you need to do uh, for it. So it's not a, not a uh, uh, like surprise for us, but it does give us some insight here in telling us if we would like to making your PCB board more thermally efficient. What we want to do is to make the PC make the heat source uh, as large as possible. Now that may not be always possible because you have a design. You're trying to minimize the size of your chip, um, and you want to make it do a lot more things with smaller size. So the size is not your control as a designer is somebody else's control where it's not thermal isn't their first consideration. They wanted to make sure it's working uh, electrically. Uh, so you end up with having to, given a small size, how to make that size bigger effectively. That's your task. The task is can be accomplished by trying to spread it, trying to spread it. Okay. So let's see how can we how can we do that uh, efficiently. Um, so I have a simple example here. I have a 100 millimeter times 100 millimeter uh, board and a 10 by 10 millimeter chip, half watt only. And if you look at the heat flux vector for the the one on the left, which have very high temperature. Uh, you will realize the heat does not really go out very well, does not spread that well. On the right hand side, I put in a copper plane, not directly underneath, uh, underneath the chip. I actually embedded it into the PCB itself, FR4s, so some distance away from, uh, from the chip. But nonetheless, that is sufficiently nice. The heat was fine that way and quickly spread. We can visualize that by a nice animation. You can see the picture on the left. You can feel the difficulty of trying to spread. On the right, happy. It's really easy for a thing to, to go outside. Um, and if you zoom in a bit more, you will see when you have that layer not too far away from your hot heat source, the heat trying to go away from the source as much as possible. Now remember that we, what we said about this, this intimidating formula, but we only need to pay attention to this epsilon, which is the ratio of the heat source to your PCB, is that effectively you are making this heat source a lot bigger by allowing it to spread easily to all, to all the area of your PCB and then therefore reduce the thermal resistance. So that's why having a plane is so important. So I think you, 
I hope you're getting the sense that the simulation can be very helpful to reveal the deeper insight of how things actually work. Now, here's another interesting thing for you. Um, many times when you design a PCB, you already have those points. So, you know, uh, you, you need to have a power, power layer, you need to have a ground layer. So that's already given. You no longer have that big pleasing effect of having a new plane inserted in there. Uh, you already have that. What other things you have? Sometimes you may have this. You may have thermal vias. People say thermal vias are a wonderful tool. Uh, you should uh, use it whenever you can, whenever you can, uh, to minimize the temperature. Is it, is that is that right? Um, in, in my title here, are, are they some of these are they magic or myth? But it, it, it turns out, I think they are a little bit of both. Let me explain. So if you consider a single um, thermal via, for example, they are one of them is here, 0.3 millimeter in diameter, and then they're uh, plated, uh, but these are center unfilled with a 0.25 uh, millimeter in comparison with the area that's right underneath my example uh, chip 10 by 10 uh, IFR4, you will notice that that single um, via does not really give you a lot of uh, uh, soothing effect because it's, the resistance is quite high compared to the IFR4 because obviously the area is many, many times smaller. The area is the key factor here, but it's not useful. It's not useless. It is useful. You see the animation I put there um, on the lower right corner is the effect of when you put a single thermal layer, what happened to the heat flux? It did find that path to go. It just probably not enough. Yeah, that means you would have to uh, try to optimize it. You, you need to use them in conjunction with the plane and optimize the number, the size, the location. I only put one in the center. That's not enough. Uh, but how effective are they? Uh, how many you should put in? What is the size you want to have? And what is the plating uh, thickness that you want to have? All those questions, do you want to try one by one? Uh, or try, try a few at a time? Boy, you can think about that. that's very time consuming, but fortunately we have CSD Studio to help here can do some simulation. Here's my, uh, some quick results here. For this example board, uh, if I put the chip at the center with no via, no plane, this temperature rise over ending is 110. That's very bad. That's only half watt and the chip is about to fail. So, but if, we do, if I do have a plane that is close to the top, half, the, the board is 1.6 millimeter uh, thick and 0.5 is about one third of the height to the to the top, and the temperature drop, drop dramatically. And you can see if you move the plane uh, to the bottom of the board, far away, 1.6 millimeter to the top, then the temperature becomes 30, 32 ish. That's not bad for just adding a plane. Um, you would, so what you can achieve by adding a single via, the temperature dropped another two three degrees. Uh, that's that's not bad for a single via. What if you add a seven by seven array right and then underneath the chip, you drop to 14. And then what if you add even more, 169, 30 by 30 array, you drop to 13.1. Um, but what if you fill the holes with pure copper? It drops further, but you know, it's probably not a significant uh, impact for the amount of additional copper you have to put in. So most people don't do that. So what I wanted to, to illustrate to you uh, is not how to design for some thermal gear for, for any, uh, for your, well, not design as a rule that you have to put 49 by 49 or you put one in the center. I'm not trying to do that. What I'm trying to show you is that simulation really reveals the insight and you should use it whenever you can because this is only works and probably not the optimal configuration in terms of number for your device. You should try to optimize it and find the minimal number of, um, of the via and get, get, it, get it to the temperature you, you want it. Now you may ask, um, hey, uh, that, that all sounds pretty good, but, but you know, is your result believable or 
or has been uh, verified. Uh, and I like to show you an example here. This example is on my own, is uh, from uh, my former colleague, Dr. Tracy Vincent. She did it, uh, a webinar, uh, Reasons Like Thermal Light. She presented her example with her permission. I'm glad to share uh, her results here. I want to show you uh, it has been exactly verified and proved to be a very effective way to design. So this is a not a typical, your typical PCB. It's a ceramic, uh, so-called LTCC device uh, with a ceramic in the middle, and then they uh, have a redesign top with some thermal VS in between. What she did is uh, she did some measurement on this device, and then she did some design of different uh, pitch or the distance between different vias and the size of the via, and she did some measurement on different power um, level and um, density pitching of different configurations, and she did a comparison of simulation in CSD using the class of what we call classic thermal solver. If you know, if you don't know what that is, no worries. I will have a slide to summarize what solver we have. Um, and then she did a remarkable comparison, and I would like to highlight the last column here. Uh, uh, the last two columns, the measured versus uh, simulated results. I think it compares really well, um, and I think you should have, feel very confident with uh, the simulation when, of course, you wanted to do it, configure right, mesh right, and all that. Uh, technology itself is quite trustworthy. Uh, so we have spent a lot of time so far talking about the conduction part and what's, what's happening inside the PCB, but we haven't talked about the convection. Um, the convection is, a, of course, very important aspect of um, the thermal design of the PCB because when the heat as we desire, we design very well. It reached all the corners of the PCB and the temperature could as low as it can get uh, without any additional help. But in the end, when the reach of the surface doesn't disappear, the energy cannot be destroyed. So it has to go somewhere. And that somewhere is the air. This air. I hope if you're designing something on Earth, it will be air and or neighboring object by, by thermal radiation. Um, so come, what we need to do, if, if I convinced you already, simulation is helpful. We need a different simulation tool. In this case, we will need the center, the one at the center called concrete heat transfer solver in CSD Studio, which solves the flow and the radiation along with the conduction all together in one package. That way, we don't miss any heat transfer mode. Uh, so the, fir the first solvers that I showed you early, earlier, called classic thermal solvers, they dealing with the conduction aspect of the heat transfer only. Uh, when you reach the surface, you use something called heat transfer coefficient we explained earlier um, to, to model the convection and radiation. But if you do want to solve the flow together with, um, with your conduction, you want to use the counter heat transfer solver. Now, CSD Studio, Multiphysics Studio, as Nate mentioned earlier, it has um, you know, many studio suites like Micro Studio, um, EM Studio, Particle Studio, and PCD Studio, allow you to do different as aspects of electronic it works. For example, the PCB Studio in my notes showed you, um, allow you to do SIPI analysis. So one of the things that they do in during the SIPI analysis is to do um, a power uh, so called IR drop and see how much uh, when you when you deliver five volt when you want to deliver five volts to your device did you actually get five volts or four point nine volts so they, they do this IR drop analysis along the way they will give you the power loss on the traces and the chips so that information along with any other heat losses or heat, heat sources in our thermal world can be easily mapped into CST and do all this uh, flow and heat transfer analysis. So that's a very nice, very nice feature. As I mentioned just now, that it's quite important to be able to obtain the accurate heat source because otherwise, how would you get how how would you get that if you don't simulate your your power dissipation? Do you guess? Do you ask someone? Do you, um, what would you do? How do you know this chip is dissipating half watt or one watt? 
or 0.7 watts, you don't know. You have to you have to make sure you get the actual power loss on your chip and the chip uh, and the trace as well. Uh, without simulation, you really don't have a good way to know where those heat source, uh, how big are they, where they are. So that's important. That CSD already handled that in PCB studio with a hair growth, right? like like I showed you here. Uh, this is just a you know one part of the PCB. There are other losses that associate with um, RF devices, and those are all included in CSD, and that can be mapped into um, into your design in, into your thermal simulation. So let's assume that we, we we have done this part, and the next thing, the challenge we have to deal with is the board details, right? The board has many details, as you see here. It has a many chips, but that's not the worst part. The worst part is actually the traces. There's so many of them. What, what happens if you have hundreds of maps? Uh, and then that's not, not a uh, uh, ex exaggeration. That's literally the, the case. So you, you may have many, many layers and many, many maps. Uh, can you model that? Can you simulate that? Uh, let's see what we can do here, dealing with four details. With CSC Studio, when you import a PCB, you have a unique capability that if you at any time right click on your PCB, you can go in here and take a look at your heat source that's either imported or it's, it's from the simulation. And now you can simplify this layer by layer. I just chose layer wise and look what happened from the, the PCB, PCB, it's going to be simplified with all the detail removed, but keep the layer of detail. And then there's another mode called all. What it does is remove even the layer details will give you a empty PCB. But you may say, hey, are you missing something out here? You from a very detailed PCB to a PCB with nothing on it. Uh, but don't worry, in during the uh, simplification process, we did not just remove things. We do calculation on the volume percentage of the conductors inside and compute what is the equivalent thermal conductivity for this PCB. Now, this level of detail would be best used when you need to simulate your simulate the enclosure, the whole device. So you you wanted to maybe run this quicker, not bother were bogged down by the details of the PCB. In this situation, this level of detail is pretty good. Um, but let's say I wanted to go one step beyond. I want to keep the details around my key components. What can I do? So this is so-called local local um, uh, detail. So you draw a rectangle around the key component. So what happens is the local uh, detail will be kept even I select all. What happened is all my PCB will be simplified except for the area that right below this uh, key components here. I'm selecting the biggest one, which usually the one that dissipates most of the heat. May not be the thermal layer of the worst, but let's make that an example. So what happened here with just a one click, as you see, a couple like one or two clicks, you are able to keep all the details. Um, sorry, you keep all the details underneath this chip, but simplify everywhere else. Isn't that wonderful? So you can have the best of both worlds. Now, sometimes if this level of details is not sufficient, you do want to model the full PCB with the entire uh, enclosure, the entire device. What can you do? Uh, it's easy. What you can do is not simplify. Yeah. Uh, so it's quite surprising. Most times PCB do need to be simplified to be able to actually run to mesh. But in version 2022, which is the version we have right now in CST, you don't have to. Uh, you, of course, I'm not advocating every single time you don't simplify. I, I want to make sure you hear me out that sometimes you do want to simplify to make things run faster. Uh, if, especially in the initial design, you are not to care about, you know, the details are not known yet. Uh, how would you not simplify? Uh, but at a certain time of the design stage, you do want to consider every single detail in your board. Then if that fits you, fits the description, then you don't have to simplify. So the question of to be or not to be, to simplify 
will not simplify. Can be answer saying, as you wish. If you want to simplify, you can. If you don't want to simplify or want to see the thoughtful impact, you don't have to. So what JC does in this case, is use your mesh as the resolution and analyze in each every cell what is the percentage of each material and give you a picture of um, the material percentage in each cell and then will compute the thermal conduction inside such device. Now, this technology is not only good for PCB, it's particularly good for PCB, but it can be used for any other things as well. But let's not expand too much on that. So I want you to take away, or the thing that you want to take away is that you don't, you can simplify, but you don't have to. So we deal with the, the challenge of four details. And now what about the packages uh, or the IC packages? Uh, you may notice if you, that in the videos I just showed, when you import a PCB into CST, uh, they are become like simple blocks with uh, a empirical thermal conductivity number. Um, but there are more advanced thermal models of those chips by the vendors that usually give you uh, either a two resistor model, which is more popular, uh, and then sometimes they give you a so-called multi-resistor or Delphi model. Now CSD support both, all, all of these modeling levels. Uh, this Delphi model will be available in 2023. Uh, it's not available in 2022 yet. Now, the same question you may ask, uh, you, you, everything sounds pretty good. Is your um, simulation result validated or verified and it's good? Um, I want to bring your attention to an example here um, called DCDC Converter PCB, uh, which is found by my, by my colleague, uh, Marcel Polonka. He actually did this. He brought in a CAD file and he actually, uh, he actually designed this, this board and he made this board and he got an IR camera um, and actually measured the, measure the temperature on this board. And he also uh, ran this in CST and compared with the experiment. That's, and compare very well if you wanted to read the blog and see his comparison. But I want to show you the process which he can't be shown uh, here. So the, well, assuming that you have done the electrical analysis with IR drop and you have all the power loss information or the heating information here. So here in CST, you see the process of setting up a thermal project based on your um, electrical electromagnetic project. It's taking the, the geometry, converting to 3D here. And remember all the heat sources are pre-computed by the Emac solver. And you can assign them manually too, if you want to, um, but you don't have to. Now, he, in this example, he simplified the whole board. Yeah, so it's run quicker. Actually, it's only run in, he obtained the results in 20 minutes on his laptop. That's pretty amazing. Uh, I think it's quite quite nice. Yeah, so this is, this is a, the whole process, starting from um, the electrical analysis, and to thermal analysis to full flow analysis. Um, so if you put this uh, or uh, another PCB in a smartphone, for example, there's, there, there will be new challenge um, in like consumer electronics uh, is the skin temperature has to be below certain level. So in this level, you cannot really um, just simulate the PCB itself. You need to simulate the whole thing, obviously, otherwise you wouldn't know what the skin temperature is. Um, so in this case, you would need to simulate the whole PCB together uh, with the enclosure. So let's see how that can be done. In the beginning, the process is quite similar. You start with the PCB. Uh, this time, the PCB can be resigned on the 3D Experience platform. And many of you probably know, you can get the CST through EMC OC role, which is, which is on the cloud role that allow you to import uh, with the same, the same software, just a, um, can be initiated from the platform, allow you to store the data, get the data out, and save, save the results. So the first step is quite similar. You do an electrical analysis, you got, get all the heat, block, heat sources. Yeah, so the PCB in this case is kept in full glorious detail with all the um, sources um, pre-computed by the Emacs solvers. 
and then you can then um, bring in a enclosure here. Yeah, so the auto scanner hidden. You can optionally define additional heat sources on the screen, for example, if it's a red up to, to assign some heat sources, you can do that. You can do that for all the chips, but you know, since we already get the accurate heat sources, we didn't do have to do that for everything. And then remember, you need to turn on radiation for natural convection. There's no fan here. And you can start this thing on a remote computer if you wish. Uh, so this is, this one is installed on, on a remote computer in about, and let me see, what is the, um, uh, the solving time? I, I, I run this too quickly, probably. I didn't see the solving time. It's not that long. It's one or two hours. And you can visualize the flow pattern. Um, on within CAT Studio or on the 3D Experience platform, allow you to view them and share with your colleagues much easier. So we talked about the the solvers um, that CST offers the um, the classic thermal solvers, the um, which solve the conduction only, and the uh, CHT solver, the conduit heat transfer conduit heat transfer solver that solve the flow uh, along with the solve together. But there's an interesting way of combining the strings together. For example, this, um, this phone example, if I were to um, solve a, um, remember this one takes take some time to solve, right? Uh, so if you were to um, solve this one in full detail, for example, and then um, and you need to make some design change, what you're gonna do? Um, so fortunately we can, we can I think, like I said, you can combine the force because um, there is very little airflow inside the phone. Yeah, you, you can you can believe that, right? Because there's no, not much empty space for air to move around. You can pretty much assume that inside the phone is uh, uh, pure conduction without sacrificing too much of accuracy here. So what you can do is CAC output this um, heat transfer coefficient map. And then when you have that heat transfer coefficient map, you can use that for the exterior of your uh, PCB and use the classic solver solve internal. Uh, so that, of course, there's approximation, but this does allow you to run something very quickly. For example, instead of waiting for one and two, and what, two hours for solving the whole thing together, you can solve all the design variations, in this case, by trying to change what, it, what will be a ABS plate, which is a plastic material, versus a metal plate, which spreading, uh, our familiar terminology is spreading is the key, uh, will help to do. I saw these guys in 17 minutes each, 1.4 million mesh, quite amazing speed to allow you to do quickly what is the um, your design options. So by offering all these solvers together in one package, really allow you to uh, take advantage of the full, um, the full package. Uh, of course, when you design any PCBs, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't just, you know, sitting in places uh, by itself. It's coming with many thermal requirements, like you need to have, sometimes you need to have a fan, you need to put a thermal interface material, sometimes you need to put a heat pipe, uh, sometimes even need to have a thermal electric cooler um, on it to precisely control the temperature, we get you covered in all of, the, all of this. CNC Studio Suite have all these features um, already built in uh, for you. Uh, on top of the things that we talked about earlier, that it, it simulates the full detail, it supports the GPU computing, uh, and of course the EMC O0 will allow you to run the things on the cloud as well. Um, so that's bring up to my um, summary. Um, so what we have done in the beginning of the uh, presentation, we talked a little bit about the trend of the PCB design. They're becoming smaller, flexible, high power. Um, and we, we, we talked about how heat transfers inside your PCB and where they go. And I hope by now you are convinced that simulation really help you not only design, but reveal the deeper insight of in the heat transfer in your electronic device, allow you to design things better to keep things cool. So with that, I'm going to um, 
conclude my presentation. And uh, Nate, I hand back to you for any questions I may have. Yeah, thank you, Warren. That was a great presentation. So we do have a few questions. I did populate them in the chat window so the audience can see, but I'll uh, I'll go through them one by one for you. Um, you. We've got about five minutes left, so um, you can expand a little bit on these. So um, first question, how to discern when to use thermal versus the CFD solver? That's a great question. So the, the classic thermal solver, as I said, only deal with conduction. Um, I would I would use the um, I would use the thermal solver only if you can safely give a good estimation on what the convection would be. Um, and it, again, because it's only running solid conduction, it runs much quicker. So there's a certain advantage of that. Um, if you don't know what is the convection condition is, you do need to run in CHT or the uh, counter heat transfer solver to obtain uh, the more accurate how flow helps you to cool things. Uh, so this is a must. Um, but if you are only interested in how heat is conducting or traveling inside your PCB, you probably can just use the thermal zone, the classic thermal zone. And a somewhat related question, I'll, I'll jump around the questions now, but how important is thermal radiation for PCB design? Oh, uh, that's a great question. The thermal radiation is always there regardless of whether you consider it not or not. So whether to consider or not is a, a choice of, of, of a designer. Uh, you value to, and you, you want to do a quick evaluation to see whether the radiation is important or not. Remember the picture that I showed you earlier about the water tank. Uh, let me just quickly uh, make that available right now. Yeah, so in this analogy, you would see if your convection only takes, like in the low end, in the, in the natural convection range, the radiation usually takes half of the heat away. And that's a very significant heat transfer path you cannot ignore, otherwise you would be end up over design your, your device a lot. Um, so, so in that case, you must consider that. When you do have an active cooling fan, uh, even liquid cooling, that can be ignored because that's not really too much to your accuracy. It's a, it's a adding up the cost. So in, the, in those cases, radiation do not need to be considered. Yeah, and the questions are lining up nicely. So I think you just answered this one. Can CST consider liquid cooling? Sounds like the answer is yes. Yes, yep. definitely. Uh, CST um, has the uh, ability to uh, model multiple fluid in the domain. So uh, you can have more than more than material, you can as many as you like, uh, as long as they're separated. They can, you know, in their own uh, small world, they can flow as, as, as much as they want, and they can interact through the solids. So that's exactly what the liquid cooling would be related to. The water, you don't want to spill, you want to just contain in the container, in a uh, piping, and then let the, uh, let the heat go. Yeah. Great, thanks. Next question, I think we've got two more, um, or maybe three more. Does the steady state solver provide an estimate of time to achieve a certain temperature, or is the transient solver needed for that? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think the transient solver would be needed. If the steady state solver uh, does not really know um, how long it would take for things to settle. Um, okay. So this is actually a very nice question because um, you can you can the steady well but let me put it this way: if you use the uh, counter heat transfer solver, which is a um, solving the flow CFD. Um, together with the conduction. So the convergency um, path uh, give you a hint of how the heat would evolve. evolve. Um, it does not give you the accurate time it requires to reach certain temperature, but it does shows you the rough path and how it get there. Uh, that's not very helpful uh, to get an accurate estimation. Uh, the best you can do to estimate time is actually 
rely on some back of the envelope calculation. Uh, there is this um, so-called lump capacitor thermal model of, um, for example, if you have a lump of object and then you want to know how long it takes for, th for this object to reach certain temperature under such and such heat load and such as and such convection condition, uh, there's a formula that says it's um, the time constant. The time constant is proportional to the to the volume and mass of this object, but inversely proportional to the heat transfer coefficient and the surface area. So you can use that to give yourself some good estimation by hand calculation. Simulation in the steady state does not tell you that. Thank you. Um, I think I can answer the next one. Does does the base CST license include all the thermal solvers you mentioned here today? I believe the answer to that is yes. Yes, indeed. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So one nice thing about CST is uh, one license you get hold of all three uh, thermal thermal solvers. Not only that, I think you get all the solvers for you might as well. Yep. Uh, correct. Benefit, benefit, yes. Correct. Yep. Yep. Um, last question. Can you yes. expand a little bit on the thermal models uh, for IC packages? Oh, that's a great question. I think that's um, uh, indeed deserve um, some more discussion, um, but we, we don't really have a lot of time. Um, let's see if I get to the right slide. No, this is not the right one. Um, I think it has, I have it here. Yeah, so um, the actual IC package is a very complicated um, in terms of structure. It has uh, dye, wire bond, epoxy, molding pound, um, and everything in between in there. Um, so to represent that, there's basically a couple ways to do that. So one is you model everything as is with no simplification. That's obviously uh, the most accurate, but it's most time consuming one. Uh, and usually not available because manufacturer or vendor of those chips do not like to share the internal construction of those chips uh, normally. They they want you to keep, they want to let you to simulate it in your device to see how their chip work, but most times not necessarily um, want to know the all the details. So um, the best way to do that um, as a as a user of those packages is to look at their data sheet. Um, to see if they provide some thermal models or not. Um, if they don't, then the best, uh, best, better than nothing approach would be the simple block. So that's give you the footprint and the height of the block, model the um, uh, flow blockage effect, and you would get pretty much good surface temperature, um, pretty good, pretty accurately. But don't rely on this one, on the junction temperature or the Die temperature is because the die is not there. It doesn't know anything about that, so it cannot be accurate. But one step further is the two resistor model. When you have uh, the two resistor model from the vendor, you're able to now predict in the junction temperature, the case temperature, the bore temperature. So um, this also carry a little caveat. The two resistor model usually is an environment dependent uh, model. In other words, the two resistor they give you is derived under a JDAC standard uh, in the code plate, top code plate, and the, and the PCB uh, theta J, JB uh, standard. Uh, that only is good for a certain situation. The resistance do appear to be changing because they're not really real resistance, they're conceptual resistance. Uh, with the environment, the difference can be up to 20%. But this is still, you know, um, give you a good feeling or good, um, understanding what your device might may be uh, thermally. Uh, the most accurate one compared to the detailed thermal one is the L5, which is uh, have multiple resistor, multi modeling multiple uh, thermal paths inside your package. This is usually very difficult to get uh, from the vendor. They usually don't supply that. Um, you have to um, inquire and uh, if they do have that, we will support that in, in the next version. So I think that's, Great. given the time that we have, we can yep. explain yep. this much. Yeah. 
Yeah, we went a little over. So I want to thank you, Aaron, for a great presentation and thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And I also want to remind everyone to register for the last webinar in the series. So next Thursday, July 28th, we'll have Emmanuel LaRue back with us presenting on the EMI, EMC compatibility capabilities in CST. So thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.